James Turnbull is the VP of Engineering at Kickstarter and is the author of The Docker Book. James, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Hi, glad to be here. This episode will focus around Docker's purpose in DevOps and in a microservices architecture. There are introductory podcasts about what Docker is, and if listeners haven't heard of it and don't know basics, I recommend going to listen to the Software Engineering Radio episode where James is interviewed, and I will put that in the show notes. James, the last several years have seen a movement towards microservices and more containers and DevOps. From a high-level historical engineering perspective, why did we get to where we currently are? Oh, that's that's a big that's a big question. Um, so I think the, I mean, software engineering has gone through a bunch of different evolutions. Like uh, I'm I'm old enough to my the, the first system I worked from was an IBM mainframe. Uh, so uh, no, I, I I remember the days where there were big monolithic bits of iron connected to dumb terminals. Um, and then that sort of evolved into that the client server architecture. Uh, we had some bypasses in there where people went back to uh, sort of terminal based uh, you know uh, distributed virtual desktops and things like that um, and I think the response has largely been the sort of the sort of movement in this direction has largely been related to the requirements of business and customers in consuming applications so uh, the sort of customers that existed when you had big iron and dumb terminals. You know, they're all in the one building. Um, they're all connected by a bit of wire to the, 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 the dumb terminal. And then it became, you know, they were distributed geographically, maybe in multiple branch offices, so the client-server model worked. And all of a sudden, you, you, you started to have the internet appearing and applications became massively distributed to the point where, you know, they, they range right up to like something that runs on your phone um, or something that runs on, you know, uh, in the cloud um, where the user could be anywhere connected by a variety of different fabrics uh, to you know, an application that could be distributed across twenty countries uh, in a dozen different data centers, and and you know provided uh, via a dozen different mechanisms. Um, so I think the, the the sort of engineering changes come in response to sort of the needs of customers and technology moving around them. This is DevOps Week on Software Engineering Daily, and I've had a number of conversations over the definition of that term DevOps. <laughs> I also. Also, earlier today, I, was, uh, I got criticized on Reddit for associating DevOps with uh, an uh, increase in the use of containers or increasing the popularity of containers. And I will fully admit that I'm, you know, I'm a software engineer that hasn't been around for like too long. I can't claim to be any authority on this stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think I caused some irritation when I alleged that DevOps has some specific practices associated with it rather than being this loose ideology. So do, do you have any strong definition for what DevOps is? I, I don't really. Um, I'm, I'm, I tend to steer away from things that are sort of dogmatic and definitional. Um, uh, there's been a couple of attempts to sort of quantify DevOps and there's a bunch of different sort of frameworks out there that sort of, you know, sort of models about culture and automation. And um, I personally, um, if I was to look at DevOps as an overarching concept, I, I would sort of look at it in terms of DevOps presents a different way for people to work together. Um, so uh, essentially, it, it's an anti-silos movement. It's a way, it's a way where any th- behavior where you operate in a silo, where you don't operate in a collaborative manner, particularly when you're talking about uh, engineers and, and operations people or developers and, and, and operations people, um, you know, particularly when you look at that paradigm, that's probably how I would sort of summarize it. I think there are lots of different offshoots and areas of interest and certainly tools and automation, uh, you know, you, you can, you know, I'm pretty sure that there's a strong bunch of uh, groups who are marketing very heavily that their tool is a DevOps tool, um, The people associate very strongly with configuration management tools like Puppet and Chef uh, and container virtualization, um, you know, things like uh, Docker and CoreOS. But I, I think that's mostly just because, uh, you know, those tools encourage, uh, often encourage that sort of collaborative uh, you know, sort of behavior rather than those tools being a prerequisite to having DevOps. Yeah, and I think there's been a subtle shift in vocabulary from service-oriented architecture to microservices architecture. Could you define what you see as the difference between those two paradigms and how Docker is iconic of that paradigm shift? Sure. So service-oriented architecture has traditionally been, 
um, communication between multiple business applications. So it's a, it's, it's a, it was a very enterprise concept. So you would often have thousands of business applications that made up some enterprise's line of business. Um, and they didn't talk to one another very well. So you, what you did was you decided to realign them in a services-oriented architecture where you basically created services out of these business apps or middleware between these business apps. And you had things like um, uh, enterprise uh, uh, service buses and things like that where, where you know, business applications could hook into their messages would translate from, from you know, whatever form the application was into this enterprise message bus um, or services bus and come out the other side to another service in a form that that service would understand. So that, that was a very sort of monolithic concept. Microservices are, are, are like the granular version of that. So essentially, if you think about a service-oriented architecture as multiple business applications connected together, a microservice is, is a single application made up of 100 or 1,000 or even 10 microservices inside that. So let's say you had a, a payments app all of the various methods or functions or services inside that payments app would be represented by a single service or, or a series of services. How does a microservices environment with Docker compare to a microservices environment that uses virtualization? So I, I, I apologize, I didn't answer the last part of your question, which is why Docker is iconic of this shit. That's fair. Um, Maybe you can bundle that into the... the yeah, so I think the reason that, that microservices have become attractive, and I, I see Docker as an enabling tool here rather than a panacea or rather than some sort of, um, uh, you know, reason d'etre for microservices. Um, so microservices, you know, uh, by their very nature, they're, they're very small, they're self-contained, um, they need to be very lightweight. So if, if you know, if you have, if your microservice is actually, uh, you know, a, a large virtual machine, um, you know, with a, it takes you know a couple of minutes to boot your virtual machine, and um, you know you you have to. It's it's fairly monolithic and, and hard to to manage. Then um, you're probably your group of microservices isn't going to be overly elegant, um, and it's certainly probably not going to be overly performant. Docker, on the other hand, is a very lightweight virtualization framework. So, when Docker container is started in sub seconds, usually. Um, it's very easy to, to create, you know, multiple Docker containers simultaneously. It's very easy to sort of shut them down and start them up and, and sort of manipulate them in that sort of very snappy kind of way. Um, and that's really you, sort of a, a strong enablement for microservices. So, you know, you, you, let's take an example of like a payments app. Let's say you need to, to process, uh, you know, your customer invoices come in on a Wednesday evening and you need to process them. So the invoice service you want to go from, uh, you know, uh, you, you don't know how, how you know, you don't have a time frame for those invoices coming in. They just trickle in as customers send them. So one minute you might be processing one invoice. The next minute you might be processing a thousand invoices. If your microservice is, is smart enough to go, ah, I've just received a, my queue of, of, of invoices is now at a thousand. I should trigger myself to spawn off some new invoice services and in some environment using a tool like Docker, uh, in sort of sub-second times I can create you know, a thousand more instances of the invoice service and process all my invoices. And when I'm done with that, I just shut them down again. Um, so that, that sort of very lightweight, very ephemeral sort of thing very much lends itself to that microservices architecture. And so to put a finer point on this, why does an environment that uses virtualization often end up looking different between dev and prod? Uh, so I, I think, I think this is true of it. I, I don't know that virtual, you can, you can sort of blame virtualization here. I think there's a, there is a, there is a continuing problem in operations and in infrastructure where the systems we build in one place differ from the systems we build in other places. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but some of it's entropy, some of it's human change. Like someone goes in and the dev system and change something to fix a problem and then doesn't realize that that change is necessary to be deployed to production when you, say, migrate your application from dev to production. Um, but the larger and more monolithic the, the, the infrastructure you're managing is, um, the easier it is for that entropy and for that user change to be missed. I think one of the interesting things about Docker containers is, is, is they really are designed to do only one thing. So if you think about building a, 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 a you know, obviously I'm assuming people have some background with Docker here, but you run Docker containers from what's called an image. An image is created from a set of instructions um, that are sort of documented in what we call a Docker file. 
And the set of instructions might be things like, uh, you know, install Apache, uh, add this website code, uh, open port 80, uh, run the Apache web server. And so, you know, in, in the sort of, the, your image does very few things. It has very few moving pieces. It has very few changes that can be made to it. And as a result, um, it's quite easy to, to sort of go, oh, something's happened here. You know, some, and it's quite easy to avoid those sort of um, uh, entro- entropy-based changes. It's also very easy to, avo- you know, to uh, introspect them and say, you know, someone's made a change here. That's really weird. I can, I'm just going to make this change back and, and, and recreate my image the way it was before. So you avoid a lot of that drift, that configuration drift that exists in larger, more monolithic apps. It's not perfect. Like there's a lot of argument to say that Docker images, you know, it's very hard to patch them. How do you, you know, if you're if you're building hierarchies of images, so you have a, a base image and you build multiple application images on top. How do you update your your underlying base image? And there's certainly some technical operational challenges around that right now. Uh, I think people are building tooling to help with that. Um, but you know, uh, you know, as with all technology choices, there are pros and cons. There are sort of swings and roundabouts. There's a common pattern of taking a set of compute instances, like EC2 instances, um, and you, this set of compute instances is called a cluster, and then you use those instances as a pool of compute powder, power, which can be broken up and dockerized or other or put in some other container. But what are some best practices around the, the containerization of a compute cluster? Um... So I think I think that I mean the key thing here is the same with any sort of clustering sort of model. It's it you have you have good configuration management, so you know what that all of the, the the nodes in your cluster are identical. You know, and one of them one of them drifts and and they're reset back to, to the baseline. Um, you have good logging and monitoring and and measurement of what's happening, so you know how your cluster is performing. Uh, you know, identify any errors. You can identify cluster nodes that are misbehaving and kill them. Um, you have uh, good orchestration tools so that. You know, if you are if you are doing things like bringing up a cluster of, of say web servers, um, and you want more of them, it's very easy to auto scale that that cluster. Um, it's very easy to bring those those nodes up in the right place. So, for example, you might have a data center or multiple data centers, and you want to bring up uh, the web service nodes in a let's say EC2 is a really good example here in a in a in a in an environment where you have reserved instances, for example, and you'll save yourself some money. So, being able to orchestrate those instances and manage them. It's kind of really critical. And how do open source tools like Mesos compare with closed source tools like Amazon ECS? Um, I think we're probably in a pretty embryonic sort of stage here. So I think ECS is still a first or second release of that product from Amazon. So it does some things, but it doesn't do a huge amount um, yet. Uh, it's you know like all Amazon products, they're sort of they're releasing it to the market for people to suck it and see. And if it's successful, they'll they'll obviously double down on it and build more. Uh, I think Mesos is probably a little bit further down the path. Um, like Mesos has a long history of sort of being a, um, a scheduling and automation orchestration tool. Um, I think Mesos's biggest challenge is that it's rather hard to use. Um, like it's still not a it's still not a tool that's sort of intuitive to use. And one of the things Amazon does quite well um, is that a lot of their tools are relatively intuitive um so i think the 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 sort of pros and cons of 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 open source versus closed source you know cons in the amazon world is you you are in the world garden you're sort of locked into that solution um cons in the in the mesos world is that you know you're it is a big complex application that requires a reasonable amount of operational and engineering savviness to run um pros of it is, is it's very powerful it's really easy to do complex scheduling and complex orchestration um, you know, cons on the ECS side, incredibly easy to adopt. It probably integrates with your other Amazon tools. So, you know, so that you sort of get a bit of both there. And I think we won't see for another you know, little while, you know, what really represents best of breed tools yet. I'd say there's probably another 12 months before we start to see some really um, sort of standout sort of tools in this space. Docker is known for being sort of a, a, a good API, a friendly API into the world of containers what is the what is the cluster equivalent of that what what are the things that would need to be done i mean you mentioned this difference between the ease of use of mesos and and what you would anticipate uh amazon to eventually evolve to um what are the pain points that uh a nicer api can help to iron out 
Um, so I think some of the stuff that's become interesting, really interesting out of Docker and obviously with the caveat that I worked there and uh, uh, I'm, I'm a shareholder with the company. But um, uh, So Docker released a tool called Swarm. Um, my accent is quite strong, so that's um, Swarm like B Swarm. Um, uh, and it's essentially it's, a, it's, a, it's an orchestration layer for Docker. And the idea is that the idea is that you know you provide a that additional API components things like you know I would like to create these Docker containers in you know on top of this Docker server in this environment in this data center oh now I would like them over here let's migrate all the containers from one place to another um, so stuff like that that is sort of um, in the traditional virtualization world sort of the VMware based world that stuff like that is sort of not rocket science it just happened like VMware publishes tools that allow you to migrate virtual machines and, uh, uh, you know, vMotion or live motion virtual machines uh, to use complex sort of storage backends and do complex networking things. Um, Docker's still at the sort of embryonic stage of that. So the, the, the key things there are, you know, extending those APIs to be able to say, I would like to consume storage resources in multiple places or particular types of storage. I would like to do complex software-defined networking. Um, I would like to be able to do... Um, workload-based um, orchestration and load balancing. Uh, I would like to do order scaling and descaling. Those sort of things are, are areas where um, there's still a lot of work to be done to make Docker a sort of first-class citizen in that world. I recently did a show on Jenkins. What are some of the subtle benefits of using Docker with Jenkins? This is actually one of the, the really first use cases that sort of excited people about Docker was that um, it's very easy to create sort of replicas of, uh, you know, close replicas of what your production environment looks like. So there's two things I think you get out of, of using Docker with Jenkins. The first one is that um, it's very easy to replicate how the application, you know, the infrastructure and the, app and the versions and everything that the application runs on production in your dev environment. So there's no more of this problem of like worked in development doesn't work in production because it turns out to be a different library or a different version of something or a different configuration set. So I think that, that Docker you know, allows you to create those very simple replicas. The second advantage is um, Docker is really fast. So if you think about your Jenkins test cycle, your Jenkins test cycle usually consists of sort of three phases. Um, the first one is sort of spinning up the, the relevant bits of infrastructure, um, you know, creating new servers. You know, so maybe your testing is destructive in some way, so you have to recycle the server every time. So you, you spend some time building those servers and configuring them to run the tests on them. The middle phase is actually running the tests, and then the last phase is like collecting the test data and spinning down the infrastructure or resetting the infrastructure. Um, in the Docker world, um, if you're looking at Docker containers that have sub-second launch times, all of a sudden you don't have to wait five minutes for you to spin up a bunch of virtual machines and run a configuration management tool to, to, to you know, configure them for the test run, you know, install your code. It's all there and running. So that, that you cut your Jenkins runtime down to just the time it takes to run the tests and collect the data. Um, and we had, um, when I first started looking at this, you know, I, I would take this use case out to people and they'd be like, oh, we should try this. And their sort of test run times might have been half an hour, an hour, and, and 10 minutes of those or 15 minutes of that might have just been fiddling with infrastructure or getting infrastructure in a position ready to run the tests. And all of a sudden, if you go from 30-minute you know, test runs to 20-minute test runs or 15-minute test runs, you, know, you cut your, your test runs time in half that makes your sort of you know your move towards things like continuous deployment and continuous delivery far easier and far more attractive. What are the synergies between Docker and tools like Chef? So this is an interesting thing that there's there's a lot of sort of discussion about about you know if if I have Docker do I need a configuration management tool like Puppet or Chef? Um, I think the I think like all situations, like, you know, as I said, Docker's not a panacea. So I think there are um, there are going to be there are going to be scenarios where you need always need both. So uh, the first area is that not all workloads can be Dockerized. So if you have operate a, an environment with like a bunch of different systems, not every one of your systems is going to be replaced with a Docker application. So you're still going to need something to configure those existing environments. You also need something that's going to be able to build your Docker environment. So, you know, your Docker servers need to be need to be created and, and managed and run and updated, um, as do your your Docker images and your Docker and your applications. I think that a lot of those configuration management tools have good tooling and hooks around that sort of automation 
uh, patch management, updating, um, that sort of facility, that, that means that they work quite well in conjunction with a tool like Docker. Is there a set of things to think about when deciding what type of hosting provider I'm going to use to put to for Docker? Like, to, how do I choose between Joyent and Amazon and Azure, like if I'm planning to, to build some application that's going to use Docker, um, what are the things that I need to consider the most? Um, well, obviously taking price off the table um, because that's what I would consider first most of the time. Um, uh, I think it's, it's – I mean Docker is, is – um, Docker's reliant on, on some – certainly in the Linux world, reliant on some, some Linux kernel features – um, it does need a reasonably up to date version of Linux kernel. So, if you know the, the most service providers these days should provide a, you know, I think given the popularity of Docker's most service providers are now shipping sort of uh, AMIs or images or, or VPS machines with relatively recent um, kernel versions. Uh, if you want to do things like you know storage and networking and load balancing, obviously capabilities like that, um, you know, you want to make sure your service provider doesn't constrain your ability to do uh, things like that. So, for example, uh, let's say I'm looking at a very traditional sort of um, service provider hosting environment. You know, I get I get one IP address, and I may not get any private networking, or uh, I certainly can't do any load balancing. All of a sudden, I've gone from a single sort of standalone application on a, on a single virtual machine to running um, you know 100 uh, web server instances on multiple ports behind a HA proxy load balancer. Um, I, I'm definitely going to be doing some more complex networking stuff and potentially, you know, opening more connections or, you know, uh, uh, doing more complex bits of bits of routing, uh, handling storage differently, needing to mount things and handle handle varieties of different sort of backends and connections and databases. And uh, I'm certainly making my architecture somewhat more complicated at the at the base level, um, and uh, you know. The, the, you want to make sure that your provider actually ca- provides, for the, provides for those capabilities. Um, there are certainly lots of, you know, Amazon being the classic example of being a very configurable environment and, you know, maybe a traditional VPS provider not being as configurable or basically providing things like load balancing out of the box that isn't sort of configurable and things like that. I'd like to go through a few examples of using Docker uh, in practice. Um, so... Let's say I'm a college student and I'm building a brand new application, like I'm building Twitter, and I know that I eventually want to scale and I want to have the entire world on my platform. Um, and eventually, I'd like to be using, you know, Docker and have Dockerized microservices. But from like a software architecture, you know, strategy standpoint, is this something I should be doing on day one, or should I just sort of build a monolithic application first and then just think about that later? Um. I mean, you know, obviously with the, the caveat of premature optimization, it's always a bad thing. Um, uh, I, I don't know. This, the, you know, this is a hard question. Um, again, Docker is an enabling technology for a particular architecture, uh, in this case microservices. Um, so, you know, obviously I probably wouldn't build my application based on choosing the tool first. Uh, I, I still think that, um, you know, uh, there's definitely... Uh, uh, a movement towards sort of you know building more distributed applications. I would look at the architecture patterns around distributed applications, and certainly uh, you know the uh, the rather famous Sun Microsystems fallacies of distributed computing, um, you know, are, are very true. Um, uh, Conway's law is very true. Um, you know, in, in this world, if I was building something, I'd be thinking about you know what is what is my minimum viable product that. Uh, enables me to to onboard a sufficient number of users to demonstrate the viability of my business model, um, and that you know, uh, and and let's assume a conservative, you know, a, even a, an aggressive growth model for say the first six months. You know, what do I need to do? And for many people, the speed of prototyping that, um, you know, something like Ruby on Rails is still an ideal choice. Um, you know, it's very easy to learn. It's very easy to build. Um, there are some very large uh, uh, distribu- there's very large application platforms and websites running out there running on Rails um, that that haven't run into the same problems that say Twitter did, um, you know. And 
uh, they didn't cost you know uh, you know hundreds of millions of dollars to build or take very experienced distributed engineers or um, I guess you know uh, having having proven the business model I might look at what you know how I might um, uh, make that application a bit more distributed or a bit more resilient or um, or look at the points at which you know maybe a monolithic thing like Ruby like Rails doesn't apply for. Um, but then again, you know, there were pe- people argue that that, I, that that what I've just said is an idiotic statement, and uh, that I sh- you should build for assuming uh, you know massive growth. Um, I, I don't know many people startups that start out with you know three or four or five highly experienced distributed systems engineers to build things. I mean, there, there probably are out there, but I suspect those people are probably not building commodity web apps. Um, they're probably building just complicated distributed systems, or they're being paid a lot of money by company like, companies like Stripe and Netflix and to build complex distributed systems. Um, I probably count on one, you know, maybe probably count a couple hundred people who I would who I would look at and go, those are the sort of people that can build like a you know a massively scalable complex distributed systems architecture like Twitter has or like Netflix has. Um, there are probably more people out there. I'm thinking about people in my immediate circle and people I you know I know by reputation. So I would probably say you know unless you have those skills on tap. Uh, and or you're prepared to spend the money to get those skills uh, and take the extra time it will take to develop that application, I would still build something that was simple and lightweight and prototypable and uh, demoable and, and something I could take to a VC or to someone whoever, whoever was funding me and say, look, this is what it's going to look like. This is what our growth estimates are. This is where I think we're going to hit the point that we need to actually invest in other bits of technology. And honestly, I don't think that technology investment will, will, be, the, will be your biggest challenge if you're in a college room trying to replicate Twitter. I think marketing and sales and uh, you know, viral growth is, is always going to be much bigger challenges in that first three to six months. Well, with respect to what you're saying, um, I think there are these, gu- these guys that are kind of like uh, such serial entrepreneurs that if they were to start another business at this point, like uh, you know, if you're Jack Dorsey and you've already started Twitter and Square, or if you're Stuart Butterfield, you already started Flickr and Slack, or, you know, we were one of these guys and you're like, okay, I know I'm going to succeed. You know, it's just a matter of when I get my product going. I mean, at that point, is it a better decision to say, you know, I'm so confident I'm going to succeed that I'm just going to build this microservices architecture up front and I'll just pivot into whatever I need to do. And it, and the pivoting will be made all the easier by the fact that I've got microservices set up from day one. So I think we ought to be a little bit careful about, and without getting into the, the, the sort of <laughs> philosophical aspect of this, yeah, there are serial entrepreneurs out there that have built multiple things. There are also serial entrepreneurs who have built one really successful thing and never built another successful thing ever. And their, their, their replication of the pattern that allowed them to succeed the first time may be something to do with that failure. Um, and also, you know, not everyone is brilliant three, you know, twice in a row. Um, so I would say that, yeah, if you, if you are that brilliant serial entrepreneur and you have this amazing viral idea uh, and you have the resources and potentially the talent on tap. Look, I, of the people I'm thinking of, certainly some of them work at Slack. Um, uh, certainly some of them work at places like Square and Twitter. And, and you know, so you know, if, you, if you could have that sort of talent on tap and you could afford to pay them the sort of money, um, you know, most people starting out in, in, in these sort of businesses probably don't have that sort of seed, seed money. Um, then, yeah, sure, you know, I think there's a, there's a case to be made by, you know, you should build good architecture that's scalable. Um, I'm, not sure you, I'm not sure that there's ever a case where you can say you can build sort of future-proof architecture or build future-proof applications. But certainly you can probably do make some better choices than say, you know, building something on a WordPress, a, a WordPress uh, plugin or, or, you know, um, without dissing Etsy, building something on PHP. Um, you know, I think there are de- definitely better choices you could make if you have some Really clear idea that that you are going to be you know, have to re, you know respond to some sort of growth thing within a very short period of time. Um, but it's been my experience in the industry of you know the, there's companies like Tumblr and Twitter and Pinterest and things like that where, that 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 is not how their growth pattern has worked out. Um, their growth pattern has, has has tended to be sudden and unexpected um, and viral and uh, you know there's only so much you can do to future proof your application for that. Um, and you know, I wonder how much investment you know you make in future proofing the application that isn't time you're spending building features that make your application viral or exciting. Uh, again, somewhat philosophical. 
Well, could you talk about some of the the use cases that you've seen when people do build like a monolithic app? And then they realize, okay, oh, all of a sudden we're scaling and we want to strip out things into microservices. Um, I think the classic example is that, that there are lots of things you have in a, in a, in a consumer-facing app that, that are essentially sort of service-oriented. And payments is a really good example of this, right? So if you think about um, uh, you know, the various processes that make up a payments app, like you know, accounts payable, accounts receivable, um, you know, checkouts, um, uh, you know, invoicing, anything that, or, or, or think about things that generate asynchronous work, um, you know, or you are, or things you are generating asynchronous work for because you know you can no longer afford to do them in line or in real time. Um, uh, you know, Twitter's classic example. I think one of Twitter's classic examples was, uh, you know, I think it was generating the Twitter Twitter IDs, like the Twitter things. There, you know, that needed to be a d- distributed, highly available service because you know you have. A million people simultaneously hit the tweet button, and they all need to have a Twitter, a consistent, contiguous tw- Twitter ID, uh, a Twitter. Um, I can't remember what they what they, what they call it, but the, you know the the, the the identifier for your individual tweet. Um, the GUID. The GUID. There you go. Um, uh, so other examples might be things like, um, let's say you're building a recommendation engine, or um, you know something that has to return like a like a or search results or. All of these things lend themselves to services, and and um, you know, I think that that uh, in monolithic apps, like uh, you, know, you start to look at those subsystems, and you start to go like this. Like if you have a tool, you know, a, t- a monetary tool of some kind, you've got graphite metrics or New Relic or something. You start to see the fact that they're spending a lot of time in memory, a lot of time in CPU. Uh, you know, the latency for those particular subsystems starts to increase, and so you're like. Okay, ten thousand people on on Pinterest are simultaneously searching for, uh, you know, a wedding cake. Um, you know, our our our, our current you know uh, search module as part of our big monolithic app um, may in fact need to be turned into a, a distributed, um, you know, service of some kind that's sort of far more you know robust and and responsive. Um, and, and I think you, you you look at monolithic apps like that, and, and you and you will you will immediately sense sort of like think about them like a, a heat map. If you look at those apps, you'll see the heat map of like this subsystem is currently the the point at which you know we are um, it, it, that is that is where scaling has hit us, like a, a comment system or a payment system or our search system or a checkouts. And, and as those sort of heat maps sort of things appear, you sort of have to go, okay, I'm going to need to re-architect that. And one of the, the very viable choices for that is obviously let's let's see if we can strip it out and turn it into a service. And how do databases fit into this conversation? If you have a database uh, that's getting hammered, uh, how what are the what are the common uh, symptoms and the common treatments for um, relieving that those problems using a service uh, or using a microservices architecture? Microservices form an element of this, but I think the um, uh, the key part of here is, is you know how do you solve database scaling problems? And and you know you can look at solutions like sharding and and uh, uh, you know any services you build obviously have to take into consideration the constraints of whatever the, the data source is at the back end. And uh, like let's say a classic example here might be let's say we create a service that that needs to have some sort of um, inherent integrity, like. Uh, you know, it has to have some sort of transactional integrity. It's really easy to do if you have like a, you know, here is a web service, here is here is a web website uh, that connects to a database, um, and you know, I, I, I and it connects to one database uh, instance, and when I, when my application happens, I get that transaction integrity. You know, I, I, I'm the, the database provides that for me. But let's say I'm trying to maintain, mul- you know, I'm trying to do simultaneous transactions distributed across multiple services. I then need to make sure that whatever is my backend database. Is able to maintain some sort of transactional integrity and not get myself like out, out of sequence or out of step, or or is designed in such a way that that's not a concern. Um, uh, and you know, certainly things like payments that's a that's a big issue. You know, the ability to sort of uh, to be auditable and or to to recover from a failure or to identify if something goes wrong. You know, what state your payments were in. It's very hard to tell a customer, "I'm really sorry, but the last hundred transactions were lost." That's not a conversation you can have in a payments world. Um, so you need to make sure that whatever, whatever you know, fabric you 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 look at, um, you know, whatever whatever backend tools you you do, you introduce have a 
an equivalent level of, of you know availability and integrity that that you know you would get from that single you know single monolithic app. Um, and this is where this starts to become really complicated because you can start to see it, right? You've got a front end that you can make a really simple story to say, oh, I now run a hundred node, a hundred you know container instance of this particular service. Um, but oh, well, how do I cache? Oh, oh where do I store? Um, oh, is Redis like my, my Redis database? Is that now highly available? How do I make it highly available? I, um, I've got MySQL at the back end. Ah, like what? So now my environment is dependent on my, my MySQL server. Okay, well, let's add, add, add some replicas. Uh, okay, but I want to distribute it across multiple data centers, and I, I now want to, I want to maintain transaction integrity, and, and I've, I've got multi-threading, and it starts. You know, it is a non-trivial problem to start to solve, and uh, I'm certainly, um, I, I, I certainly don't claim to have any, any. Uh, no, I, I think I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a reasonably okay engineer. Um, I find that most people who are serious distributed system engineers make me feel a bit like a dunce. Um, but I, I think one of the things I am conscious of is this is a really hard problem to solve, and that uh, you know, uh, as long as you start to recognise that this is not a panacea, it's not a we will just deploy a microservices architecture and all our problems will go away. I think as long as you recognise that this is this is a deep end of the pool you are swimming in, then then you are going to probably approach this with a relatively healthy attitude. Good. Okay. So speaking of deep ends, uh, I'd like to to discuss an example of analytics using docker and spark or MapReduce, and like how would you set up you know what are the fundamentals of setting up a data warehouse that leverages these new technologies so i think that this is actually another really good example of and i'm not um there's there's a bunch of spectrum sort of things around this data warehousing is one of them um uh high, high performance trading is another um uh, large-scale scientific things is another example. These are all examples where there are lots and lots of little nodes that do little bits of computation. Um, like MapReduce is a good example of this. Uh, some large scientific al- applications, um, the sort of things that um, people like CERN do and stuff like that is, is that like there's this little machine that runs this calculation together next to 100,000 other little machines that run this calculation. And they build a model, for example, or they feed data to a model. Um, Docker's... Um, the Docker is, is actually, an, well, this is one of the ideal use cases for Docker. And I, I know for a fact that there's some very large scientific um, uh, uh, computation things that are being moved to Docker because um, a lot of the more traditional sort of high performance computing sort of world, that, that tooling and technology has not advanced very much. Um, like, like you get, you know, they, they, there's amazingly performant hardware, but the tooling to manage high performance computing kind of sucks. Um, and it's not really moved much forward since the sort of 90s, 2000s. And it's probably it's a little a ironic for something called high-performance computing. Yeah, look, there's probably some people in a bank somewhere <laughs> who are currently shouting, shouting at this podcast going, that guy doesn't have a clue. We have all this amazing technology. But um, like, I bet you anything that they've built a bunch of stuff in-house that only applies to their environment and is not re- reproducible elsewhere. Uh, that requires a in- significant investment in really smart engineers. Um, Docker, on the other hand, uh, you can create a Docker image that contains your computational environment, like the tool, like a like your MapReduce. The, the 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 code required to run your MapReduce job, or the code required to run your scientific, you know, calculation of some kind, or to run your modeling, your your trading modeling job, or to run your trade. Um, you can create that in the image. Um, you can it, it incredibly fast time. You can spin up those containers. You can spin them up. You know, order scale up thousands and thousands to respond to different needs. You can spin them down again. And really importantly, you have the tooling to go, okay, we've changed our algorithm. I can then go out and update our Docker image and go, I'm going to deploy a bunch of new containers with our new algorithm in them uh, really, really fast. And I don't have to worry about old nodes hanging around. I don't have to worry about old nodes having old versions of the, of the algorithm. And if I've developed really smart tooling around this, um, you know, I don't have to worry about, um, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a classic story in the financial trading world of like, you know, what happens if your your half your application starts up with the wrong trading algorithm uh, and decides to go to war with itself? Um, you know, uh, that sort of stuff is something that that with a very ephemeral, really fast moving sort of sort of technology like Docker, you can help build stuff that will will, will uh, enable far cleaner and far more elegant sort of you know large scale computational stuff. I think that's um, what happened in Knight Capital. Yeah, I was going. I, I, that was the example <laughs> I was thinking of. I, I wasn't sure how well known that example is. Um, but uh, you know, I, I'm not certainly saying Docker would solve that problem. 
but in terms of the issue of like change management and the issue of like, you know, I, I have I have a very clearly way to introspect that, you know, all of my 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 computations are running on an image that has the latest version of the algorithm or this version of the algorithm. I think Docker has a bunch of inbuilt things like the, uh, you know, Docker images are layered. Um, they have a, you know, they have a char associated with the with the or at least have you know a, a code associated with each layer. I can introspect and identify. There's a bunch of tools coming to be add security to that, so you can actually say only run uh, these signed images in our production environment. So you can actually say sign off on the new transaction code uh, and deploy it. So there's there's a bunch of things around that that make that sort of workflow and that sort of environment really sort of um, a bit more idiot proof than they could be otherwise. Um, I think that the the sort of the more basic idea of setting up those sort of data environments like that is that. Uh, a lot of those companies, um, uh, you know, Hadoop, um, people doing sort of, uh, uh, you know, large-scale sort of data warehousing and computational stuff have started to publish Docker images and examples of how to use Docker. Uh, and in the more complex environments, like, you know, big Hadoop environments with HBase and a bunch of other things, um, people have actually started to publish sort of um, some re- reasonably complex sort of infrastructure, if not moving some of their infrastructure towards natively supporting Docker as a format. Um, so... I know, for example, that one of the reasons that Mesos supports Docker as an execution engine is that is that it, it was a you know there were a bunch of people asking like we want to run jobs in you know we want to schedule jobs using Mesos in Docker because of these advantages. Um, so the Mesos team said, okay, well we, we should make Docker one of our execution um, uh, environments, and you start to see a lot more of that. So I think that if you approached the vendor, or um, certainly as as time goes ahead. If you approached Amazon and said, you know, one of our examples for ECS might be to take things from Kinesis and r- run it into Redshift, or um, to do, uh, you know, um, take you know, do processing of jobs in SQS or something like that. You know, I'm almost certain that they will be thinking about that sort of stuff as roadmap items. Um, and if you're interested, almost certain that, that those sort of use cases will be addressed pretty quickly. So we've talked about some best practices. We've talked about change management, the conversation that we've just had, how can we circle that back to the DevOps world and further articulate why why this conversation is relevant to DevOps, particularly to people who still uh, may have been listening to episodes throughout this week and still don't understand what DevOps is? Sure. Um, or hosts who are giving interviews and still don't understand what <laughs> DevOps is. So here's, here's, here's the classic example. So let, ask yourself why Docker exists. And Docker exists because um, – so containers are not new. Containers are not a new technology. They've been around a long time. Um, containers on Linux, uh, LXC-based containers have been around for 10 years maybe. Um, they were always really hard to use. They were always sort of ungainly and they required reasonable amounts of fiddly configuration. And, uh, and a bunch of companies used containers to do things. Etsy, for example, their deployment pipeline was built on containers well before Docker existed. Um, but um, – the, the Docker came along and, and it became immensely popular and, and sort of popularized containers and everyone suddenly started, oh, my, containers are amazing. Containers have always been kind of amazing. They've just been kind of hard to use. Um, and so Docker was designed to solve this problem of like, I have code. Um, it sits on my machine and I test it against something or I test it in my dev environment. But it's really hard to get to production. Like I got to jump through a bunch of hoops. I got to run my tests. Uh, when I run my tests, they all pass, but they give the code to, to the ops guys and they run my code, they take my jar file, and they run it in production, and nothing works. And they call me up at four in the morning and say, we did our deployment, and it doesn't work. And I say, well, it worked when my test ran, worked on my, works on my machine, um, you know, what's your problem? And all of a sudden, you're in this conflict-based situation where you, know, you have this code that has this business value, this dollar value, and you want to get it out so the customers can consume it, but there's all of these roadblocks and obstacles and, excuse me, friction in the way. Um, and if you think about Docker was designed to try and reduce that friction. It's like I can create a replica of my production environment running locally. I can run my code on it. And if I run my, that same code on the same Docker image in my production environment, I, I know it's going to run. You know, like I know it's going to work. And if you think about DevOps, it's the same sort of experience. It's like I would like my code to run in production without those ops guys yelling at me that it's broken. And those ops guys would like my code to work. Huh. Maybe if we talk to one another a bit about this, maybe if we use some of the same tools, maybe if we identify where things go wrong and have a conversation about that, instead of having a conversation post the fact, like in a war room after something's gone wrong, 
how about we have that conversation before we deploy the code? And, and I asked them, for example, like, you know, um, I've tested it like this. I've run in this environment. Here's, here's, the, here's how it all works in, in my dev environment. Is that going to work in production? And they go, no, because the network's set up differently. Or no, because we have a firewall. Or no, we run, the, we run an older version of the JVM. Um, all of those conversations are about that sort of collaborative work I was talking about earlier, about that sort of DevOps movement. It's like instead of having this conflict-based thing where you, you're reacting to things that have gone wrong because you just didn't talk to one another in the first place, you have that conversation up front and you all get to, to be successful. You all get to deploy your code. Uh, and to quote sort of Luke Kinnies, who who's one of the author of Puppet, you all get to go to the pub on time. Um, and I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in uh, not only producing a really a much friendlier much more collaborative work environment, but one that has like you know, we all get to the pub on time. We all have have a have a you know a job that we enjoy, um, and that you know we don't come to work going, oh crap, I have to talk to the development team because their stupid deploy didn't work last night, and the CEO is going to yell at me. It's going to be my fault. The developers are shining prints, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, considered to be untouchable, and it's all you know. I'm I'm channeling a bitter operations person, but you know, I can channel a bitter engineer too. It's just like. Those operations clowns, they have no clue. They treat my beautifully designed code like shit. They always complain that it doesn't work. Like those conversations, they're not fun places to work. And, um, and DevOps is sort of around trying to change that environment. And I look at Docker as a tool that helps enable that change. Um, you still have to have that conversation. But if you can have the conversation and go, by the way, a bunch of that friction could go away if we have this thing that might solve, solve this problem and this problem. Um, you know, that's a pretty interesting conversation. So Docker is such a uh, general purpose tool. I'm curious if there have been any instances or what's, what is the most, uh, uh, the, the instance that ex- exemplifies this the most, but have you ever like seen some user of Docker that is using it in a way that is just like totally unexpected and that just blows you away and is like really subtle and fascinating and makes you think like, oh, I have, actually, I, I have absolutely no idea how this product is going to be used in five years. Um, I, I don't. I, I think every now and again I'm surprised. Um, uh, when for people started talking to me about Docker as as micro routers, so like um, if you're doing software defined networking or software defined data centers, then Docker containers represent the components in like what, here's a router, here's a switch, here's a firewall. Um, uh, when people started using Docker containers as virtual desktops uh, and as playpens and environments, so like if you're um, if you're like JS Fiddle, like they you know people at your know, JavaScript Fiddle site, um, you have to provide a, basically a, a clean environment to a bunch of people to run the JavaScript in. That's actually a reasonably tricky problem, man, and it's fairly compute intensive. Um, but if you could replace all of those things so that every new person who refreshes their screen uh, with subsecond latency gets a brand new Docker container that, that, that has JS, you know, JavaScript installed in it and presents a browser window and, and they can just put their JavaScript in or or their you know, Go play thing environment, whatever it happens to be. Um, those are kind of interesting things that I hadn't sort of considered when I first looked at Docker. I mean, my background's heavily um, operations and enterprise, so I was, I was thinking about that high-performance computing. I was thinking about that service-oriented architecture, microservices world. But there are a lot of people out there that are, for example, uh, um, who, do, who do things like run consumer apps inside Docker. They present out like a, uh, their Twitter client or a browser or uh, an editor, um, or they treat it as a way to have a portable environment that goes with them. Like some people uh, cart around like a Vagrant image or something like that where they, they, so they don't have to run on someone else's machine. They can just spin up a Vagrant image um, uh, or they can, you know, um, you know uh, there's, a, there's an equally solid use case to be able to say I can just, you know, run Docker and have a bunch of Docker containers that have multiple desktop tools or desktop environments uh, I don't have to worry about moving my dot files around from place to place because I've created an environment that has my dot files in it by default. Um, like uh, there's, there's all sort of examples that I, I hadn't really thought about um, as being something we'd use Docker for. That JS Fiddle example is really cool. So are are you? Sh- that's actually how they implement JS Fiddle. I don't know whether it's JS Fiddle, but I know that, that there are at least um, a bunch of those sort of companies that provide uh, sandbox environments. Um, uh, I could, I could, I can't remember off the top of my head, head or whether I'm allowed to say. Um, but <laughs> sort of when I was at work at Docker Inc., there were at least four or five companies who used to come to our meetups regularly, who provided a variety of different sort of sandboxes. Um, you know, uh, you know, 
PHP or Ruby or um, there was people doing a regular expressions engine. Um, uh, there was the Go, some Go folks. Um, uh, there were lots of people doing editors and things like so, like um, uh, and also people doing. Um, I think there was somebody doing um, what's Twitter uh, Bootstrap uh, doing? Um, like you could create your Bootstrap um, uh, in uh, Bootstrap uh, uh, environment on the fly with um with a uh, you know like because you could build your your Bootstrap based um, website structure. Oh, that's um, cool. So, of, like, yeah. host your CSS somewhere, and, and your you JavaScript, and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, and then you, then when you're done with it, like, it, it produces a little zip file you can download, and then when you come back and refresh, you get a fresh environment with a new version. Like, and there was some cool stuff like that that I, I was like, I, I we never would have thought of that, but you know. I uh, see. Yeah, this is a useful conversation because now I'm thinking about like Squarespace. Like, maybe that's how Squarespace works. Maybe they spin up a Docker instance every time you open up the Squarespace editor. Yeah, um, I guess the the. The key thing there is that obviously it's really fast, but it is somewhat ephemeral. So you need to actually make sure that you know if someone if someone closes their browser or refreshes or or does something inappropriate that that you know you don't lose what they're working on. Um, I think that's probably still. Uh, um, I, I, but I think if you're a little bit smart enough engineer, you could probably find a way around that. Um, but yeah, like that's a that's a really good example of how, how they might. I don't know whether that's how Squarespace do it, but um, uh, I think that their their editor probably predates some of this stuff, but. Um, yeah, that's certainly a good, a, a cool use case. Um, I see a lot of training examples too. Like, um, if you're running a training lab with forty machines in it, instead of having to image every single machine or recreate the virtual machine, um, you actually provide Docker images, and people can create Docker containers. And so they like, uh, like if you're t- teaching someone how to code, or you're teaching someone how to use a OpenStack or something like that, then like they run stuff out of Docker containers in the training environment. If something goes wrong, you just kill the container and create a new one. So because students always stuff this stuff up, right? Like some student goes gem install something and then and then bust the training environment, which is no fault of their own. Um, like you can either go, oh my god, I have to reimage the machine or recreate the virtual machine, or I could just kill a container and start another one. Like those are really interesting sort of examples. Like Docker's entire training program is run out of labs that run on Docker containers. So you you know it's 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 a Docker inside Docker often too, which is uh, even more uh, sort of turtles all the way down. Yeah, so um, turtles all the way down. So not to drink the Kool Aid too much, but to to begin to close off, like, do you think there is anything uh, in Docker that tells us about the future of consumer operating systems? Like, is it going to look something like you know we're using like a super lightweight Chromebook and we're just accessing like containerized services to do everything and i mean what well, do you, well, you think- kind of just described an android phone right um, i guess that's true <laughs> um so i think yes is the answer to that I, I think the the idea of sort of uh traditional operating systems and distributions will go away um like i can't see like us I me mean, downloading a windows or a red hat in 10 years time um I can see me consuming a bunch of containerized, uh, by some form, maybe not Docker, but containerized uh, applications and services that can sit together to construct like my environment. Like it's essentially exactly like having my Android phone, like which is essentially a series of containerized applications running on on my hardware. Um, this is probably like my my computer is in fact. And if you look at in certainly in terms of the UI sort of experience, you know what what Microsoft's done with Edge. And with um and with Microsoft Windows 10, it, it's designed to be that sort of same sort of feel, right? Even if the, mm. the the technology behind it isn't there, but it's like I would like to grab and Chromebook same way. I'd like to grab Office, but I don't really care about um, Outlook because uh, I use Gmail, so I'll grab Gmail as well. Uh, and I use Square, so I'm going to grab Square and PayPal. Uh, and I'm also a, a big fan of, of Pinterest, so I'll grab Pinterest on my machine. And and like you know, I think that sort of environment is 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 far more sort of likely. Um, and you don't need a big, huge operating system to run that on. Um, you really only need to be, and, and, you know, you don't need a lot of, you know, that, that's not a complex series of, of interactions anymore. Um, and or no, no, sorry, that, I shouldn't say that. What I should say is, is you you don't need to care about that operating system as much anymore. So it, I don't need to maintain it. Like, how how many times am I likely to want to poke it open and configure something inside it? Like. Every version of, of OS X and Windows has become, has become more about uh, hiding that configuration detail, or from except anyone except the power users. iOS is a classic example of this, right? Um, 
how many people go into the actual setting stuff in iOS? How many normal humans, like as opposed to geeks? Like I, I, my my dad has never opened up the settings thing in in, in iOS unless I told him to, because um, he has no need to. Like everything just comes down like configured in the right way, and he maybe does some configuration in app every now and again. But everything else just worked out of the box, um, and that's the way I see operating systems heading. It's like these thin skins where everything just works out of the box. And you know maybe some of the people that maintain those operating systems, like like you know uh, people like me and other engineers, are focusing on building really cool things instead of like managing an operating system or installing a user or tweaking some stupid setting. Yeah, it'll be interesting to watch. Well, James Turnbull, thanks so much for coming on to Software Engineering Daily. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about? No, I, I'm good. I, I, I want to apologize for the fact that I, I have a bit of the flu, so uh, if I was incoherent at any point. Well, my voice was a bit raspy. It's uh, I'm recovering from a head cold, and uh, I certainly, uh, I certainly hope I, I, people were able to understand me coherently. It was good fun, and thanks very much for having me. 